General Vutel, thank you for speaking with CBS News. As a retired four-star general who had direct oversight for the region, what stands out about the Israel-Hamas conflict? Well, I think it, 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 first of all, it's great to be with you, Catherine. Um, I think what it, what it highlights to me is the, is the continuing siren call of the Middle East, uh, that, there, that the United States has enduring interests here that are going to uh, always call us back to it, and that it's important for us to make sure that we have a sustainable approach uh, to look after our uh, national interests in this part of the world. What are the, uh, what are the game changing implications to the October 7th attack from a U.S. national security perspective? Well, I think one of the one of our interests, of course, is to prevent instability across the region. And what this uh, what this incident or this attack by Hamas onto Israel uh, basically portends is the is the opportunity for a wider uh, regional uh, conflict. And what we've been watching over the last um, several days here, week and a half, almost two weeks now, is uh, has been a very uh, careful. Uh, calculation uh, by Israel, by the United States, by a variety of others here, of trying to take action against Hamas without necessarily provoking a wider regional conflict. So the implications are here is if we aren't able to to navigate this razor's edge effectively, we could find ourselves in a in a in a conflict that is that spreads beyond Israel and goes to other parts of the, of the Middle East where. Uh, where we will, it will obviously uh, stabilize the situation and, and result in, uh, in a much broader conflict than we currently have. Just to take that a step further, do you see as part of the broader conflict uh, Iran, even Russia and China? Well, uh, whether uh, whether Russia and China get involved uh, directly, I, uh, I think is an, is another matter. I don't know that they necessarily would do that, but you know, both of them uh, would benefit by the United States being tied up in another regional conflict here in uh, in the Middle East. Uh, Russia would be able to point to it as uh, as more problems caused by you know, U.S. foreign policy, and China would be able to take advantage of it in in their uh, part of the world, uh, the Asian Pacific here, uh, because. Obviously, a conflict in this part of the world would would put a premium on our resources and on our attention and on our diplomatic and informational and economic efforts. And so it would draw it would necessarily would uh, draw attention away from uh, the very important things we're trying to do out in the Pacific. And if it spills over, do you see Iran getting involved? Well, uh, I guess we'll, we'll see with that. I think Iran already is involved in this. Uh, uh, it may not, they may not necessarily be playing a direct role in terms of uh, of being, you know, primary combatants in this. But that's not the way that Iran operates. Iran operates through these proxy organizations, like Lebanese Hezbollah, like Hamas, like the uh, uh, Shia-aligned militias in Syria and uh, and Iraq, like organizations like Houthi. So Iran never puts their own skin in the game. What they do is they they use others to do their bidding. Um, so we shouldn't we shouldn't think that Iran is not involved in this <clears throat> because they very much are through their proxies, which is their primary way of, um, of pursuing their objectives across this region. And to take that a step further, do you see Iran's involvement as limited to financial support or going to the training of operatives and recruitment for October 7th? Well, I think it's probably all of the above. I mean, it certainly is political support. It's informational support. It's economic support. It's uh, it's military support, probably in the form of of uh, equipment and arms, munitions, uh, maybe advisors or trainers uh, in terms of that. And then, of course, <clears throat> you know, they play this uh, extraordinary role of of uh, orchestrating a, 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 an architecture or a network across the region that supports all of these organizations. So uh, they, they play a number of absolutely critical roles to uh, these groups and the and the activities that they are undertaking. So they are very, very much involved in this. Today, IDF tanks and troops uh, pushed into Gaza mm -hmm. in a limited incursion. Is that another indicator that we are on the cusp of a ground invasion? I think that it is. Uh, I think it was an interesting development here. Uh, but uh, in retrospect, I think it makes some sense. Uh, from the limited information that I've seen on it, I think their intention was to 
set the conditions for a broader uh, broader campaign in uh, in Gaza, which of course we have yet to see unfold. Uh, but uh, you know, clearly there's a variety of reasons for doing something like this. One is to set conditions. Second is to is to keep uh, you know keep Hamas uh, off balance. Third is for informational purposes and demonstrate to their own population that they are taking taking this Syria and pursuing actions. And you know, fourth is to is to kind of get the lay of the land, understand what they're dealing with and and again start preparing preparing the way for what might be a, a larger scale incursion into into Gaza. Is it that preparation that explains the delay on the ground invasion? Well this is a really complicated situation. I mean this is is as we've is a number of people have talked about and we've seen in the media and our listeners have certainly heard is, you know, this is a three-dimensional battle. It's not just the surface and the streets, it's tall buildings and it's a subterranean uh, tunnel system that, you know, is some, somewhere on the, on the, in the area of 300 miles of tunnels underneath this. So it's a very, it's a very complex uh, piece of urban terrain. And then when you add on to that other complicating factors like the presence of 200 plus hostages and a and a rapidly deteriorating humanitarian situation and the threat of a widening conflict on on the other uh, Israeli frontiers uh, this is not necessarily a decision that can be taken lightly or cavalierly so i think the uh, the deliberateness of this is is good and i think it reflects that uh, the israeli military the israeli leadership uh, is taking a very deliberate look at this and is going to is going to approach this in a deliberate professional military manner which is exactly what we would expect from them in this urban warfare environment what is the single greatest challenge well, I think the, the the greatest challenge is is getting bogged down into a, into an urban environment. You know, in my own experience uh, during our fight against ISIS, particularly up in Mosul, um, uh, while we didn't necessarily get bogged down when we get into when we got into the western side of the city, this this was very slow, deliberate fighting. Uh, you know, measured in progress of by by feet and halves of half of city blocks for days in terms of the advancement. So you can get bogged down in this very, very quickly. Um, and, and Hamas will be prepared for this. They've had time to prepare for this. Um, so um, uh, getting bogged down into this and, and having to commit resources uh, uh, beyond which they are prepared to, to uh, commit, um, absorbing the, the international community's uh, assessment of this uh, are all things that could work against Israel and their ultimate objectives in terms of this. So it's really important that the, that the campaign that they devise is one that is really focused on achieving their objectives and trying to achieve them in a manner that is can be done as quickly as possible and minimize the impact on civilians and, and other aspects of this, which I think, again, accounts for why we're not seeing a rush to get into, into Gaza. What is the IDF's objective? Well, I think the IDF's objective is pretty clear. It's it's to destroy the war-making capability of Hamas and prevent them from ever orchestrating an attack like this on Israel or holding Israeli uh, towns and villages or the Israeli population at risk from rockets or missiles or other things that uh, emanate from Gaza. So I think they're very much focused on, on, uh, on destroying the war-making capability of Hamas. Once the ground incursion begins, do you expect it to move very slowly, as you've just described? Well, I think it depends on the approach that, uh, that Israel takes. You know, um, you know, in in our own doctrine, we we teach a variety of different ways of looking at uh, urban urban operations. Of course, there's been a lot of discussion on very deliberate operations where block by block clearing. That's certainly one approach here. That's very slow. Uh, it's 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 much more controlled uh, by the attacker, but uh, it is very it is a very deliberate approach, and it can take a lot of time. And and once you secure areas, you have to hold them. A second approach might be. Uh, what I would refer to as kind of a rapid advance, and that is moving forces to critical locations, not necessarily clearing everything, but going to critical locations in Gaza and gaining control of those and then and then uh, you know, emanating out from those locations to uh, to secure uh, to secure the area. And a third option, I think, would be kind of a combination of indirect fire strikes, much like we're seeing airstrikes and other strikes that are taking place in there, 
with uh, with raids uh, that go in to accomplish specific missions. Um, the 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 difference here is raids, like we saw in this raid that took place uh, this morning, is that 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 includes a plan withdrawal. We don't necessarily we, they won't necessarily keep troops on the ground. They'll go in, accomplish a mission, and then come back out. Uh, so there are a variety of different approaches that that this could take. And, and we might see a combination of all of these over the course of a, of a campaign. Um, so uh, this is, this is pretty sophisticated planning. Um, and uh, I, I have no doubt that the Israelis with, you know, with uh, the advice of, uh, of, our, of their American partners are, are really looking at the, uh, at the best approaches to take to this, to this very difficult situation. Is the humanitarian crisis being sufficiently addressed? Well, it, it 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 there certainly is a lot of attention being paid to it, um, and uh, uh, right now, and it's 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 it, as it should be. It's forefront in the news right now, and we should definitely pay attention to this. Uh, whether we are whether everything that is being done that uh, can be done to take care of innocent uh, Palestinians who have been affected by Hamas's attacks and 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 the expected and, and necessary response of Israel, uh, I think is another question. Uh, I think this is an important role for the international community to step up. It's not an easy situation. It, there's not a lot of space here. Uh, there are real concerns in Egypt about this uh, and in other parts of the region, as we've heard the King of Jordan and and the president, President Al Sisi, talk about uh, with uh, with respect to this. Uh, but uh, the, the international organization has to come to grips with this. We have to figure out ways to get a sustainable level of aid to uh, to the Palestinian refugees, internally displaced refugees. Uh, and we have to make sure they're safeguarded, um, and we have to look after the basic needs. And uh, uh, while this while this conflict uh, plays out, and ultimately and hopefully moves into some political uh, solution down the, down the line, uh, but uh, but yeah, this is this is a very critical factor, and and uh, unfortunately, the Israelis and and many others in the region have not had the opportunity to prepare for this. Uh, frankly, um, you know, when when we went to Mosul again, I hate to always go back to that. We actually incorporated a, a significant amount of humanitarian planning into that, and we had the space. We established corridors, we established camps, we ensured that resources were stockpiled to take take care of the civilians that would be displaced as a result of military operations. So it may be taking a little bit of time to get that in, but uh, there's no doubt that the uh, that the focus of the international community is on this and the resources are there. We just need to get them in place. On the ground invasion, is this a period of extreme risk, also in terms of the response from regional players? It, it certainly is. I mean, uh, the Israeli forces that go into Gaza will be doing this at uh, at extraordinary risk. Hamas is uh, will make the full use full use of all of the weapons that they have available with them to include booby traps and improvised explosive devices and other things that will impede and make progress by. Uh, by the Israeli Defense Forces is uh, more challenging throughout all of this. And of course, actors like Lebanese Hezbollah, like the Iranian-aligned militias in Syria, uh, organizations like uh, the Iranian Quds Force that is repositioning in eastern Syria, can all take actions that can make things more difficult for uh, the Israelis as they do this. And uh, and obviously, uh, you know, that could cause them to have to divert attention or to divert resources to other parts of the country uh, while they are pursuing the, the, the campaign in, in Gaza. So, yeah, I think there's a there's a fair amount of uh, of uh, of risk in all of this. And of course, anywhere along the line, a miscalculation, a misstep, on 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 any part uh, could lead to a widening of the conflict. So uh, we're really trying to thread the needle here uh, with with what we're doing because there are just so many factors uh, that have to be considered by the Israelis and by those that are supporting them uh, uh, in this in this conflict. And and, uh, and I think we're trying to do our best by being deliberate with this to prevent a wider wider conflict. What will it take to bring the American hostages home? Well, I, you know, uh, obviously, I think that's uh, a, form as, a foremost factor in all of this, and I, and I, there's no doubt that this is a big, this is a big uh, variable, big consideration in the in the, in the eventual ground campaign into Gaza. I, I, I must believe that. Uh, 
uh, our, our, our American capabilities are working with the Israelis to uh, share information, to share technology, to share uh, approaches to how we do this uh, so that we can bring people home in this. It's really the, the negotiation aspects of this are critically important. And, uh, and I think the United States has a well-developed capacity in this that we've developed over the last 10 or 12 years that uh, has allowed us to uh, get people out of out of difficult situations for this. So um, I, I think we all hope for the best in terms of this, of trying to get Americans out. It's hard to me, hard for me to to appreciate what uh, uh, what uh, Hamas attempts to achieve by holding American and and really a number of other international hostages in this particular situation or any hostages at all, uh, because uh, frankly it, it's it's uh, it's not not overall going to change things in the long run. The Pentagon has moved considerable assets into the region. What do you believe is the tipping point for U.S. military involvement? Well, I think the I think the movement of our of our forces in the region has been designed to do a couple things. One has been to posture posture our capabilities, so we're in a we're in a better position to respond. It's also been to make sure that we can contain the the, the conflict, and you know that involves deterrence, and deterrence is a factor of both capabilities and will, and and certainly what we've heard from our our our. Our leaders is that uh, that is 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 a very clear message to others in the region not to test this and not to become involved in this because we do have capabilities. So we've got to we've got to get resources in there and we've got to make sure we can deter and and contain this and we've got to be in a position where we can support the Israelis and prevent the widening of the conflict. Just like we saw a few days ago when one of our one of our ships in the Red Sea shot down some missiles that came out of. Uh, Launched by the Houthis, uh, headed towards uh, towards Israel. That's a that's a that's a good that's a good example of what we're doing. I think what tips this is is uh, something uh, a direct attack on on American interests or American uh, citizens in the region. I think could be a little bit of a changer for us uh, and require us to take a more aggressive or direct role in addressing that specific situation or perhaps maybe getting more involved in uh, in the broader conflict. I don't necessarily think it's in our interest to, to get uh, to get involved in the broader conflict. We may have to do that as a matter of, of course. Uh, and, and if that's the case, then then I think we're well postured for that. Uh, but I do think uh, the threatening of American interests, and that could be diplomatic, it could be military, it could be commercial. Uh, we have a lot of all of that across the region. Have you worked alongside Marine Corps Lieutenant General James Glenn, who's now in the region consulting with the Israeli military? I have, and uh, Jim Glenn is a superb officer. We served together in uh, in Iraq, and uh, I, I think the world of him is just one of these extraordinary, extraordinarily competent, uh, professional, experienced uh, officers that we uh, that we have out there. I have very, very high regard for General Glenn. What skill set can General Glenn offer the Israelis, especially in terms well, of I think the... he, sorry, he go, obviously go ahead. go ahead. Yeah, I'm sorry. Yeah, I, I think he brings some experience uh, uh, of you know urban combat and and really operating in the region, and I think he brings with him uh, you know all the well-developed planning practices and approaches that uh, the U.S. military uses when it conducts military operations. So I think those, all of those are good. And I, you know, I, well, one thing I just would remind our listeners of, uh, Catherine, is that, you know, in addition to, to General Glenn, you know, the, the, the most competent war fighting command that we have, United States Central Command, uh, also has responsibility for this area. And our commander there is extraordinarily well uh, well experienced, and he has a very large and, and capable staff that can also help with this. So I think it's really important to make sure that the efforts of General Glenn on the ground uh, uh, and the things that he's doing are well coordinated with uh, with our other military activities and and with uh, U.S. Central Command, who has very strong relationships with the Israelis and with many others across the region, and which really I think is a is part of our secret toolkit here. Mm -hmm. Do you see any scenario where U.S. forces would be on the ground in this conflict? 
I don't right now, um, other than what we're doing to posture, to, uh, you know, deter, to protect ourselves. And then, you know, as we just talked about, to to support the, to support the is Israelis. Um, I, I really don't. I mean, I, I, I guess I can imagine some things that might happen that might that might require some uh, some more forces to, to be on the ground. But uh, right now, I, I think our approach has been has been about right in terms of this. Has the departure of U.S. military capabilities from the region negatively impacted this concept of U.S. deterrence? Well, I don't think it's I don't think it's helped. And uh, yeah, I think I think one of the things that we are going to have to come to grips with here with this is that is that the military we have national security interests in the Middle East and those a part of protecting and preserving those national security interests means that we have to have a sustainable military presence in the region that uh, you know is is there is reliable is res is responsive and is reassuring to our partners in the region and that looks after our our interests there it doesn't necessarily mean that we have to maintain tens and hundreds of thousands of troops or endless amounts of ships or aircraft in the region, clearly we have a greater priority out in the in the Pacific. There's no doubt about that. I don't think you'll find many people that will disagree with that. But it's important to appreciate that that um, our security in the Middle East is really linked to the broader strategy that we have of of uh, preserving our influence, preserving our values, preserving the norms. Uh, that the United States and many of our partners have stood by for decades. Um, so we can't look at regions like the Middle East and and just uh, cut them off from uh, from our support. We have to find a sustainable way to look after our interests for the long term. Any final thoughts, General Votel? Uh, not really, Catherine. Thank you very much. It's, it's, I'm, I really appreciate the opportunity to talk with you about this in depth about a variety of important things. And I appreciate the efforts you're taking to make sure the American public understands what's at stake here. General Votel, thank you for speaking with CBS News. Thank you. Thank you.